What is up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Panthers Nation Network here at our new home, Locker Room Charlotte. And again, just a great display all around. Hey, look, man. Hey, look, we, we come, we do it big every week. You got the Kerry Collins jersey. You got the inaugural 92 jersey. I mean, bro, I mean, you got, you got the Moose jersey, feeding time. Anything with the full body Panther, anything with the real life Panther, it, like, like yeah, this yeah. right here, they, they have stopped doing the NFL right. When they had the mascots wearing the shoulder pads on the shirts, that was my favorite thing. And then I talked about this last week. I told y'all about the hat. He pulled it out. Look at the flames on this. Look at this. It's like Jeff Gordon puked on a Panther's hat, and I love it. <laughs> it's awesome. Jason, sorry I couldn't have you here with us, buddy, but how are you doing back in Virginia? Oh uh, man, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I, I, I hate I couldn't be there as well, but I am digging. I am digging the backdrop this week. I mean, the all black jerseys going with the all black sweatshirts. I'm digging it. See, so you Pretty get fire. you get the treat every week. Now you're gonna get to look at this, and we just look at you know the camera. We don't get to see you in person anymore. But um, talk a little bit, man, a bit about man about like, just this space and what it was like coming to see it for the first time. You you know, for me, it was the 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 feeling of home almost. Right? Is it, it was the vintage. The vintage gear, the smell of the vintage gear, the look of it all, it really brought back when the Panthers first came to the Carolinas, gave me that kind of that kind of fire in my belly, especially when we started talking about training camp. I said, we got lucky, like, as the Panthers. We were a team that was created right around the height of what is now vintage. Yeah. You know, you got the graffiti, you got the 90s starters jackets. Like, that's what you want for a team. Bro, it's the apex of fashion, bro. I mean, at this point, at this point, everybody wants to rock the 90s jet. Right the 90s, where I, mean, I got the leather Panthers hat that is on. Crazy. Like, it's, I mean, it's a bunch of different stuff in here, but we got a bunch of gems in like with this Panther within this Panther fan base as far as clothing wise. It's like where's Walter? You find something different every time. Yeah, All right, so now to the serious stuff. Obviously, training camp started up second week again. They just finished their last day at the time of recording this. Fan Fest will be tomorrow. Their first Bryce Young's first Fan Fest, Frank Reich's first Fan Fest. It was a bit quieter out in Spartanburg because you know everyone's planning to just come to fan fest so it's like why make the trip down to spartanburg if you ain't got it and for all those people i could not be more sympathetic because it was hot out there but what were some of the things you saw that you want to talk about i mean uh, the biggest thing was uh lavisca chanel i think how they've been using them out of the backfield what we expected to see uh they, they said it was going to try to use a lot more versatility with him and we're seeing now with the full off season you see what what that make it look like where they could lead to saw him taking some handles out, out of the backfield even seeing a lot of people talk about how his route running has improved. So, I mean, at least for him, that's a part of his game that was probably the biggest question mark I had for him coming into the year. But seeing how he's he's been able to, to, to click and connect, and alongside DJ Chark as well, that him and Bryce Young have seemed to have a great connection in the first week of training camp. Yeah, Jason, what about you? What are, you, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, my, my nephews went down on Sunday. Um, the feedback I got, you know, from their point of view was the same. You know, they were really surprised about how DJ Shark was really showing up and showing out, you know, that connection with Bryce Young. Um, and another thing was um, they really were impressed by the placement of the ball by Bryce Young. You know, because of his stature and the way and where he puts the ball to give the receiver the advantage over the DBs, you know, we haven't seen that in quite some time, especially from an accuracy standpoint, right? That was always a knock on Cam, you know, even though he's our, he's, he, he's our most successful quarterback. Bryce Young seems to be doing it on a rope. It's going to be interesting to see. Um, as the, as we get into these scrimmages, it, will it be the same effect on some of these bigger DBs, you know, that he doesn't see every day? But, again, that's, that, that, that remains to be seen. Yeah, you know, it's different depending upon the speeds they were in. So, like, you know, obviously they were in full pads yesterday. They weren't in full pads today. So that kind of changed a little bit of the dynamic. But when you go through his 11-on-11, 11 11, had a couple runs. He had a couple good passes and a couple good place balls. Like, there was one, it was Barno coming off the edge, and he was rolling out, like, right to meet him. And he kind of, in midair, like he jumped up and almost like a free throw, or, you know, a foul shot. He threw it over top of Barno to connect with Thomas on the flat. That was one of his more impressive throws. He had a couple good out routes. And the coverage was really well, too, from a lot of the DBs today. You know, they can't tackle, but, like, the first one was a pass out to, to Thielen on an out route. And JC was right there, ready to clamp it up. Like, he would have he would have broken it up if it was full contact. So... I'm liking seeing that. Right. And, I mean, another thing I've seen is, like, I think Monday, I'm from the full padded day, a lot of the defense seemed to get a lot of praise about how well they were playing. Bryce did seem to have, have his troubles with, with the Panthers starting defense on Monday. But, I mean, it's, that's to be expected. But I, I am liking, I'm liking what I see from the defensive back group at this point. Yeah, you know, we talk like, Keith Taylor was one of the biggest question marks. He's had a good last couple days since this practice has started up. He had a pick today on Bryce. Now, to be fair, it was a rough route. Like, it was Ian Thomas going on, a, like, an out route in the end zone. There was not a lot of space between him and the pylon by the time it got to Ian. 
Keith just undercut the route and was able to get a pretty nice pick off of it. He's running with a little bit too much time in the pocket. Like, he's taking a little while to throw it sometimes, and I'm like, you're not going to have that much time to throw the ball, like, at all. But I think, you know, seeing guys like Keith Taylor, um, I know there was a pass broken up by um, – uh, I think it was um, uh, Moore was the guy's name. It was a pa- He had a pass broken up. It was a nice-looking one-hitted catch from Josh Van if he would have completed it. Right. But I have seen a lot from the DBs. Jason, what were your thoughts on some of the scuffles that have happened over the weekend and today? Well, I've been hearing it's getting kind of chippy down there. I hear Von Bell may be one of the ringleaders in those in that chippiness. Um, but, that again, I'm loving it because it's, it's giving us an identity early, right? That attitude is coming through early, which we're going to need going into this season, especially coming through – the NFC South, and especially since we are seeing the NFC North. So it's going to be a dogfight week in and week out this week, uh, this year. So, Yeah, I will say, especially with the NFC North, because they've already made their presence known. I've seen a Justin Fields or another Bears jersey every single training camp practice I've gone to, and I'm predicting we're going to see one tomorrow too. So I, it's just getting – that's I'm trying to push that away. But, yeah, it's gotten chippy even today. Brian Burns and Icky got into it after the play, and it was interesting because I couldn't really tell what – like sparked it but then the next play icky jumped off sides and so then he got pulled out so then then he went straight to camp and and talked to him for a little bit and so the i mean that's what you want to see though that fight we talk about the defense you know bryce having some problems you want your defense to be able to perform well like yeah, yeah i mean bryce is his first week of practice like what are you expecting right this i mean iron sharpens iron at the, at the end of the day i mean you you want to have guys like avon bell set the tone he's the guy that we're thinking in the secondary he's going to elevate this entire group him setting its own that's why that's why i like to see brian burns and icky going at it yeah these are your two best guys you know this this is your franchise left tackle and this is your franchise pass rusher you know you need those guys go going head to head go those guys you know com, being competitive i mean there's no there's i mean like i said we we seem to have a different identity the the energy around the squad is different it seems it seems to be a lot more pride amongst the group i mean i, I like seeing that come out i mean if it i mean you know these camp scuffles these are good for camaraderie i mean you uh, these guys they gotta stay with each other every day it does get a little irritating being with the same guys every day practicing against, against the same guys every day but luckily that ends soon and i mean and, and then once you start seeing other competition man it'll just you know it'll just be like everyday work yeah i think that especially with them staying in spartanburg together and there's no escape we talk about the benefits of that but then also like it is just ball. There is no distraction. Like, Fan Fest, I, and I think that's why they might have done it on a Wednesday because we were talking, you know, pre-show about why they would do it on a Wednesday night. And funnily enough, I don't know if it's legitimately confirmed, but, you know, the FC were playing in their League Cup matches, which they hosted, and they made it past the group stages. Because of Fan Fest and then the Beyonce concert coming up, they weren't able to host on Thursday when they're supposed to be playing it. So they're playing mm. out in San Francisco. People are pissed at the FC because it's like, couldn't you play anywhere else in North and South Carolina? Right. But as we were saying, you know, having it be on a Wednesday, I think is kind of good. You know, it breaks up because then they have a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday camp practice. And it's not, you know, back together Saturday. It's not like anything light or fun. It's full speed before the Jets come to town. Yeah, and that's the biggest thing. Yeah, so the Jets are coming in town. And I, I think one thing I'm taking from that is they're coming in with a chip on their shoulder too. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because everything that's going on out there, I, I guess you've seen throughout the week, this whole chirpiness between him and Sean Payton, which is definitely giving me some more fodder uh, when they come in to see us. I think it's going to be a definitely interesting matchup between, you know, the sauce gardeners of the world. And I, I'm hearing Mingo is looking real, really, really good. There's a lot of high expectation for him over the past couple of weeks in training camp. Absolutely. And you, I mean, you start looking at the Jets. I mean, I mean, Aaron Rodgers taking a $35 million pay cut. There's, uh, he seems as serious as he's ever been about bringing in talent and wanting to compete for a championship. Like you said, guys like Garrett Wilson, Sauce Gardner, we'll get a chance to see our young guys and see how they elevate, how they play. I mean, I, I would say I'm waiting to see who what DJ Chark looks like, but I kind of feel like I know what Chark can be. It's just it's a matter of availability when the season comes. Terrace Marshall, I would like to see – when the Jets come to town, I would like to see how he competes against Sauce Gardner. How does he look against a secondary that was very stingy last year, to say the least? It'll be interesting to see how defense also line up against us because we don't have that true number one wide receiver right now. Like, I mean, right now, though, I'd say the best connection outside of, you know, Adam Thielen, it's been Bryce and DJ. I mean, he had three touchdown passes in red zone. They did a lot of red zone today. It was a quicker practice, but a lot of red zone. He had three touchdown passes to DJ Chark. 
and they were all really good plays balls as well. So he's been building up that relationship with DJ. And I think Frank Reich alluded to it like right on that first practice, like in minicamp when DJ was healthy. And he was talking about how he was mentioning off kind of the things. He's like, you know, Adam Thielen's your experience in the locker room. DJ Chark's your big play guy. Like he said that from the jump, which was really interesting to me because at that point in time, they hadn't really they hadn't established a kind of hierarchy of wide receivers. And we've been talking about TMJ kind of needing to take that step up. I don't think they're going to be putting a lot of pressure on TMJ to perform. I think that's kind of what's been put upon him in the last season. Mm -hmm. And as a head coach coming into a new squad, I don't think he's going to push the envelope with TMJ. He's going to make sure he has his plays on this and, you know, on the 10 play sheet. But honestly, I think that he's going to try to keep it, you know, kind of low profile for him. Yeah. But why would but I, I think that's gonna be interesting because we're, we're giving a bigger look to the rookie who I feel is gonna end up taking his spot in that top rotation. If you're looking at Dylan Sharp and Mingo, those big bodies, I think he's gonna come almost like a six man off the bench, almost in that whole rotation. And, and like you said, uh, and like you said, Jason, I mean Mingo has flashed in camp so far early. I mean like. I've seen as much about Mingo as I've seen about TMJ to this point. And, and like I said, this is a new different – this is a different coaching staff. It, there is a matter of can these guys transition into playing for these guys? How quick is it for them to learn? I mean, going from learning a one system to another, it does take a little bit of time, at least for Mingo on, on the bright side. This is his first NFL system he's getting to come into, getting to work with, uh, getting to work with the, the wide receiver coaches that we kind of feel are – up to par and OC that we feel like he's up to par. I think for Mingo, I mean, yeah, this is a this is a great great for him. But for TMJ, gotta wonder it maybe is the transition of having to play for a previous staff and having to unlearn some of the things that we thought maybe held him back before. Is that kind of slowing down how he looks in camp right now? Yeah, and it's interesting because you talk about it, like Mingo when we drafted him, we were like, all right, what's his position going to be? What's his role going to be with this wide receiver room? And going into camp, that's only made the conversation tougher to have, right? Because you're going to have to, and I think that's why it's been a lot better that LaVisca is getting the looks that he's getting. Because the only real way you can justify him on the roster to take a wide receiver spot is if he's putting in extra work as that, you know, that wing back, that X back, that star back on the offense, if you will. You know, he's got to get some of those handoffs. He had a touchdown today. It was only about, you know, seven yard kind of, it was a, it was a quarterback read mm -hmm. which they have not and i don't think they're going to they haven't really shown any quarterback runs they shouldn't at all and they should they should <laughs> no they shouldn't but um, exactly you know lavisca had a had a he had a touchdown run so it shows where he's gonna go about it and it's the same thing you know tmj might be your middle of the route kind of guy but they've also been running tight ends in the slot they've had every tight end run in the slot See, yeah, I was going to ask about that. Is, is Tommy Trumbull showing any any signs of promise in that role? Because he was one of those people, like we talked about last week, and that we continue to bring up. I'm not, I'm, I'm kind of shaky on him right now. It's interesting, you know, Hayden and Hayden still didn't go full speed with the eleven on eleven. They're still holding him back a little bit. They were running a lot of Ian Thomas on that eleven on eleven. Tommy Trumbull okay. did. Get, he was working with the twos though, and that was what we were talking about. You know, about having to have someone back there. So they were running. Uh, you know, I might. My thoughts might have been, you know, a bit misjudged because they were running Tommy with the twos. He was running out in the slot, running out routes, running digs. And he was he had some pretty consistent routes and some pretty solid um, receptions there. He had, I think, one or two receptions. So they are trying to put him in that position. Is Steven Sullivan, where is he at at this point? <sighs> Steven Sullivan, I think, honestly, is one of the more talented tight ends on the team. And I think that he's obviously the most veteran tight end on the team. And so they haven't really shown him outside of, you know, anything else. He doesn't really get that many reps from the outside position. Whenever he is on the field, he is running. It's in a, like a two tight end system that I think they will try to implement. You know, we did it in years past with Dixon and Olsen or, um, you know, uh, Olsen and, um, and Manhurts, that, those same kind of sets. Yeah. And I think that might be where he falls into place to try to provide some, you know, some sort of a decoy, take some of the attention off of Hurst. Um, but I mean, when Hurst is going in his ISO and their ISO drills, he looks good. I mean, I, that, yeah. that's, that's what that's what I expect. That's what we signed him to be. We signed him to be that star tight end that can that can actually provide us with some with some type of receiving threat. Uh, Giovanni Ricci, uh, I know he played more of a fullback role for us last year. Is he? Where is that? At? Is he, are we thinking he's maybe a, a camp casualty at this point? You know what? It's funny because you mentioned that in minicamp. I was talking about it. in minicamp they were running the fullbacks with the tight ends, and they, I was seeing like, he was running. You know, he was running corners. He was running cross routes. He was running with the tight ends and running out in the slot a lot. But come to training camp, 
I cannot – I'm trying to think about it. And I don't think I've seen him run a route in, like, an 11-on-11. I mean, they keep their 11-on-11 periods very quick. It's, like, literally maybe eight plays for a lot of their periods for 11-on-11 in these past few days. And depending upon how long they want the practice to go, it might be even more or less. But I have not seen him – actually show up in any of those regards so you know it's funny like with the one Steelers fullback that retired the rookie one four days in the camp it's kind of a similar thing where I have not seen him and I don't know if that's just because they don't need to see anything from him they don't want to run any of that stuff but I mean even in like pass protection I can't I'm trying to think about going back and what I've seen from him and I can't peg a play where he's been an impactful part of the play outside of just lining up to help pass protect so it's interesting yeah one thing Oh, my bad. And I was going to say, the one thing it seems that this coaching staff is being very deliberate and, and, and diligent on picking who they want to be on this team and aligning them soon. I mean, we've already started waving people, bringing other people in to put more depth in spots where we've talked about we didn't feel like during the draft or even in free agency we went after aggressive enough. So I'm very interested to along the lines of the Giovanni Ricci uh, conversation, right? We continuously see our coaching staff – definitely putting their names on up up on the board and saying these are our top guys now where the rest of you going to fit in yeah i think that's why they brought Deion jones in i mean they saw it we talked about it you know i texted you were like <laughs> seems like none of the water or the linebackers are making any splash or you're or that uh smith's not making a splash name me a linebacker that is you know right right and i mean and i'm but, but from what i've seen though a lot of people are happy about deciding because this now allows louvre to go down to the edge and be more of that edge rush type which to be fair kind of plays into why you haven't seen a signing at that edge rush position yet. I mean, because they seem to trust Louisville enough to be able to be that guy for a full season. I mean, I, I'm hopeful because if he showed you anything that he showed you last year as far as being able to come off the edge, show that any type of flash or flare, then having that alongside Brian Burns, that's exactly what we've been asking for. And like I said, Louisville's been like the steal of that of that Matt Rule era. If there were any positives, Frank Louisville would, would be one of them. And it's funny because Frank Reich, mentioned that specifically you know he was asked about Luvu because he was already doing that kind of stuff today like from the get-go he was already coming up into this first level to be able to do that and he talked about it and this is ex what I was wanting from you know you're starting to see this week especially where Frank Reich puts his evaluation on the guys that were brought in that we all had question marks about you know Frankie Luvu we already knew he was a steal before mm -hmm. Frank Reich came in but Frank Reich has he literally said verbatim like, he is such a steal. And he asked Scott Fitter, like, how did we get him the way that we got him because of the talent that he provides, the variability that he provides. So that gives me a lot of confidence. And you see, though, on the other side of the spectrum, Bravion Roy, a guy who was, you know, he, God bless him, he would not get cut. Like, he would make sure <laughs> that he was not cut and he would fight to not get cut. But even him, you know, he couldn't surpass the casualty. They cut him out and uh, – they brought in, you know, another guy, another defensive tackle as, from Alabama to get a workout. Um, but it shows how he evaluates, you know, these guys that Matt Rule had brought in. Right. And, you know, I thought things were, 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 you know, would be different this year because there's only one big cut at the end of the preseason. I'm thinking, okay, we won't see too many guys get away. We won't see a whole lot of that. But now it's like, okay, if you're on, if you're there in camp right now, be thankful because this, this, this could be your last day. Yeah, and it's interesting. I think, you know, you even talk about, like, wide receivers that get cut. I mean, they add a quarterback in for no reason, just honestly for ISO, ISO drills. Um, I think that might have been a bit mis misinterpreted by not only us, but just around the NFL, where I think there, it's not a hard and fast deadline. Like, this is the only time you can cut. Right. I think it's more so just, like, you don't have to have the number dwindle down by these moments. It's just you can do so, and it might give them more freedom to do what they're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Wave a guy today, wave a guy tomorrow, pick up another guy today, and then that way they can spend more time working them out. Because I think that's honestly, you know, the, the workout periods had to be so far and few between. You had to do it and make sure you had it pretty well done. And they can still do that. Like Deion Jones, they worked him out yesterday, signed today, you know, signed at the end of the day. And then and, and on the field, he was already putting an immediate impact. And, you know, he's got some years on him, but he can still move. Absolutely. I mean, for us, we haven't had a, a linebacker that we thought could play alongside Shaq Thompson, what, since Denzel Perryman for like the two days of training camp? Yeah, for like the two <laughs> days he was there. Yeah, that's about it. So, I mean, adding a veteran presence like that, I mean, that's something we know we needed. Uh, we didn't draft anybody that we thought could, you know, could, you know, surpass or, 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 or supplant anybody that we've had in place thus far. So, yeah, to this point, I mean, if we don't see anything from Brandon Smith, then adding veteran guys has to be the answer. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to ask you real quick, since we're talking about veterans, 
One name that's been real quiet that I'm surprised we haven't heard more about is Jeremy Chen. So I know you've been down there. I know you've had some visibility. You know, we're talking about these positions along with Shaq. They were talking about moving Chen around a little bit in that, in that linebacker spot to also help out. We signed Dion. So what have you seen from Chen or have you seen enough of him to see how they're trying to use him or even scheme scheme him? Yeah, so first, like, off the bat, like, the first 11-on-11 play was Bryce Young a dig route, or I'm sorry, excuse me, like a 10-yard out uh, to DJ Chark, and Jeremy Chin was right on him. Like, if it was tackling, he would have tackled him. He would have brought him to the ground. He followed him to the sideline, and that was, you know, maybe 7, 10 yards, and then straight out, and he was coming down on a swivel from that third level like we thought he was going to be doing. I think it's kind of like what, and I hadn't thought about it, and I was actually listening to the radio, and they were mentioning it, it makes sense. You remember, you know, for South Carolina, we have the spur position, yeah. that hybrid, you know, safety linebacker that plays both those spots, and I think that's really what he's going to file into, and that's what he was kind of doing today. And so that's where I think they're able to move guys like Frankie down. You know, it's like moving everybody mm-hmm. a step down because if you utilize a safety position on Jeremy Chin, well, then you have to take away Woods or Rowe or Bell. You can't have one of them in the ball game. Right. At, well, with Eric Rowe, I, I don't. I haven't heard much about him either. I, I, to this point, has have we seen any impact from him thus far? I haven't seen a lot from Eric Rowe in, in 11 on 11s. He has not been a, a bit of a rotating guy. Um, you know, he's working in a lot. And he's another one of those, like, okay, is he a safety or is he a cornerback? He's played both. Right. You know, most notably, obviously, he was cornerback for Miami. But he's able to do both. So I haven't seen a lot from him. I think, you know, they're going to – I don't think they're going to do nickel cornerback a lot. Like, in terms of – for the one thing, you don't have the depth to do it right now. Like, there's not a true starting nickel because CJ is healthy, but he's not playing like it. You know, Keith Taylor has been making, you know, splashes. Um, and then outside of that, I mean, you've got your camp, you know, darlings, Rajon Wright, you know, somehow still Stanley Thomas Olivier. You know, I'm thinking he's going to be the next – he's not long for the Panthers team. He might be the next Baylor round of cuts. Um, but no, you know, for your questions for Jeremy Chin, I think he's going to play that kind of spur position and run around like that. Eric Rowe, I haven't seen a whole lot from him as we've been going around and it's been interesting on the defense. Like we talk about the offense, how much they've been rotating guys Mm -hmm. for the defense. It's been just the starters. Like there's been some guys in the front line that have been switching around on the front four, but outside of that, like you've not seen like bumper pool. You haven't seen anything from him. Mm-hmm. DJ Johnson, we haven't seen anything from him. Like, they're keeping it when they're doing these sets. Even when they're running the ones and twos, they're keeping the defense pretty similar. And I don't know if that's just to give them, you know, more time to get used to this new scheme, right. which I think is probably what it is. But it's been interesting to see. I don't know if once, you know, we get more into preseason, they'll start to open it up a bit more. But, I mean, these guys have been very, very quiet. Yeah. Have been going. Yeah, that's what I was going to allude to. I was going to allude to the fact that it was most likely because – these guys, this is new for all of them, and they want to provide them with some sort of familiarity as we go into the season. And we don't have a lot of time to be 100% honest. I mean, it's not like it used to be. So I think for them to do this transition and to bring the coaching staff in, it's something, it's some, it's something definitely well, well, well warranted. No, I agree with that. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, FanFest, I'll be interested to see how they, you know, I'll be interested to see what more they pull out of the woodwork if they're going to do some more flashy stuff, you know because you do have a lot more fans showing out. Right. And uh, I've never, you know, been to a fan fest as, a, you know, as working it. So I don't know how they structure it. Um, it's been actually probably about a good decade or so since I've been just a fan fest in general. Yeah. So it'll be nice to go back to. A decade? I have, I've never <laughs> been at this point. So, I mean, I mean, I, I can't imagine it's going to be that that much different. I mean, I, the energy obviously is going to be different because, I mean, new regime, new quarterback. We'll see how, you know, we'll see how it all looks. I know, p- you know fans are going to be excited to be able to see those guys in the stadium like for the first time since draft night. Would it, would it, yeah, yeah so. I mean, and that's and not even seeing those guys, you know, actually getting to do anything, you know, just seeing their face on TV as they're sitting there, you know, watching it. Right. Pray to God that the weather's all right for it because they just have a love to do that to us, you know, have something going down when we're trying to be at the stadium. But I think it is interesting to see, you know, one of the things with Jeremy Chin we were talking about, obviously Derek Brown, he has the fifth-year option in his contract. Mm-hmm. Jeremy Chin doesn't have that option. So this is the end of his contract. So, you know, Burns are going to be working through. Are they going to want to franchise tag Derek or put that fifth option on him? But what do you do with Jeremy Chin? You have to wait, have to, you have to wait and see how the year goes. I mean, we, we, don't, we haven't figured out a true position for him yet. 
we tried him at you know different spots his rookie year he was more of a just a football player more closer to the ball closer to the line of scrimmage then we tried him at as, as a true safety in the next couple of seasons so now it's trying to hopefully get him back to a similar position that he was in his rookie year hopefully you can re reignite that flame that you saw then and maybe get him some, maybe get him resigned but honestly if if i had to bet he would be the guy you may have to part ways with in order to make room for the other two yeah, I think yeah, I would I would I would hate for that to be the case. I mean, we would have done him a grave disservice underneath the snow regime. Um, we didn't get the chance to see his full potential spark uh, with that regime. So putting him in that category, I, I get what you're saying, Shantis. But at the same time, I would hate to see that because I think he's he's definitely uh, one of the main cogs that makes that makes that whole defense flow. Yeah, like he's going to be the real big X factor on defense this year. Like it's going to be able to – he frees up, you know, you have this depth and safety like we talked about. But if you have him taking up one of those spots, then it creates a, a, a problem where you cannot play all the safeties that you want to. And then with linebackers, you know, we've obviously brought in one guy to try to, you know, mend the gap, but it's not enough. Right. You need more guys. You need to have that. And so you're hoping that he can facilitate that extra linebacker spot because if not – then you have to cap Brian Burns, you know, pull him back. Right. And we've been wanting to see that variability from him, but the more we go about it, like, I want to see Burns do – I want him to see him be full Burns. Right. I don't want to see him, you know, have to keep switching back and forth. We can't find him on the field. Like, I don't know where he's in coverage. And I honestly think that, you know, he Chin could come down and play. Like, you know, we had – some of the best years we had on defense was when TD and, and Luke Keekley were playing that nickel linebacker position, you know, dropping back into coverage – where Keekley had, you know, six picks that year. TD had five picks that year. I'm hoping Jeremy Kin Chin can kind of play that role too. Absolutely. But, I mean, we, I, like I said, we, it's a lot of figuring this thing out because Averro's defense is a lot different than what we've seen before. It's not necessarily the most traditional 3-4 defense that we've seen. So, we just got to check. I mean, we got to get a chance to just get a, you know, get a look at how Brian Burns looks at outside linebacker, get a chance to see how Luvu looks like with more of a, you know, with more edge responsibilities. And well, I mean, we just kind of just got to go from there. Honestly, the biggest thing is going to be what preseason looks like for me, as far as how these guys start to gel and how quick can they pick up the system and work in concert together. So, who do you think is going to benefit the most from preseason? Preseason, I would say, I'd probably say Mingo. I'd probably say Mingo on the offensive side of the ball, just just because I mean, the, the, he'll get a lot more reps. I mean, he, you, you'll obviously get to see him work. Uh, with you know probably probably a lot with the twos and everything like that, but we'll get a chance to see how he looks like in NFL competition. If he's already made waves throughout practice on a regular basis, then seeing what he can do on a, on a, in a preseason stage for him is going to be huge. Just because nobody he's competing against has proven that they can consistently do it on a big game day stage. So, I mean, it's the, the the floor is wide open for him to take over. JB, what do you think? You know, I'm going to kind of piggyback on that. I'm really looking forward to seeing what the receivers are going to do. Um, from everything that I've seen, it seems that they're gelling the quickest. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that, um, you know, Bryce did take them down to SMU and started started doing some work before OTAs and in between OTAs. I can't remember exactly when, when I read the little article about what he did with Thielen and DJ Chark, and, and that's why they're gelling. So I think the preseason is just going to bring that much more into into play. Um, because that's going to be what we're going to end up going to. I think we're going to see a lot more downfield action this year, right? Yes, we are a run team. Yes, we are a bruising team. But I think we're going to see a lot more downfield action. It may not be the pretty 30-yard throws, but it's going to be enough to move the chains and put us in position where we're not looking at third and long like we always do. Yeah, I mean, like they were showing it. They had a bit more run plays this week, you know, that they were doing. I mean, nothing outside of the tackles, like nothing spectacular. We're just trying to keep it, you know, ground and pound, what they want to do. A lot more Chuba, still some Spencer Brown they wanted to throw in there, so that was interesting to see. I think for me, for who can benefit the most from, I'd say, preseason, I think would probably be a guy like DJ Johnson. I think if you're, you're going to be going up against, you know, preseason offensive lines, you're going to be going up against not, you know, necessarily put together offensive lines, and you still have one of the bigger question marks. You know, you turn – Marquise Haynes, we know what we got from them. You're still a question mark. But if you want to actually have some sort of impact, especially when you were drafted and where you were drafted, like, you got to show you can do something. And I need to see something from you to show, okay, we have some depth at this position. We have people that can make waves at the position. Because other than that, like, why are you here? What, what are you doing for us? 
Yeah, I, I kind of hate it. For, I kind of hate it for DJ Johnson because I feel like I've forgotten about him as soon as training camp started. Yeah. And even your tour too. I, I mean, I don't know if you see anything, but I haven't seen anything noteworthy at least on like, at least on Twitter. I haven't seen anybody talk about him at all. So. For those guys, I mean, yeah, they need to be guys that are looking to step up and elevate their game because, I mean, we kind yeah, they got to they got to go ahead and solidify their roles. I mean, that's that that that's what that's all about. I mean, it's it's time, like you were talking about your tier. You got to make your bones now, buddy. I mean, if not, we're gonna use you. You're gonna be expendable, and we're gonna be able to bring somebody else in that can do the job. So, I mean, it's now or never for a lot of these guys going into this first preseason. It's interesting the way they are doing training camp, and I feel like. They are going so. I think it's because of the urgency that that they have right now. Like you need to make sure that with the new coaching staff, new systems, new schemes, new players, everything's got to be like right off the bat. So they're not really taking the time. Like obviously in ISO drills, they're obviously getting a lot more reps. But when it comes to these eleven on elevens, I mean it is starters and it is starters all the way. So you get second team coming in, but especially even on the offense, when you bring in a second team, you're switching in linemen, running back, and quarterback. The wide receivers are pretty much going around like. I know Gary Jennings had one really good catch. It was like a long bomb from Andy Dalton today that I saw. That was a pretty good one. But, like, especially defensively, too, I mean, they're keeping it very just t- – they're keeping it very tight as to what they want to do because of how much they feel like they have to achieve going forward. So, like I said, once we get into preseason, it'll be interesting to see. And once we, they get back to Charlotte, it'll be interesting to see how they kind of change the way that they operate with who they let in, what they're doing, and how they go about preseason doing it. Because I think that could show some, you know, ineptitudes for a lot of these guys where if they're not getting these reps in training camp, well, how do you expect them to do well when the preseason rolls around? So I don't know if when they get to the Jets joint practice, if they're going to make sure they get more time for those guys to make sure you're not showing your starters too much in a joint practice, which is what I would hope for. But, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of those guys, you know, whether it's injury. I mean, obviously, like Cameron Peoples, we're looking to see what's up with him. Zavala, you know, we're looking to see how he's progressing. And they said he was progressing a lot better than they thought he was. But there have been a couple of those guys that have kind of just fallen by the wayside. Yeah. It's, it's, it's always funny every year because you love everybody you sign. You love everybody you draft. But then come training camp, you start to see who starts to rise, who starts to fall. Guys that may have been, you know, the, the darlings going into, this, going into the year just kind of, you know, they just, they just kind of drift away into the wind. And, I mean, like even, like you said, guys like a Steven Sullivan, I know people – I know I've seen some people actually – Sink his praise like he we you like say he hasn't had anything to do with camp thus far. Bumper pool, a guy that we thought that maybe a linebacker, right? Yeah. We would see more from him. He hasn't done anything to this point either. So it's like if it, if we haven't seen anything from you to this point, I don't know when we start to see, it, especially with less training. With, well, you know, with you know training camp being more condensed, less preseason games, you don't really have a lot more opportunity for the, to get these guys going. Now, keep in mind, obviously, when it comes to training camp, you're not going to see that much stuff from defense because it's not it's not built for defense. No. Nothing that's going on right now is built for a defense to show off other than the cornerbacks and defensive backs to get, you know, some good interceptions. Like, they can do some pressures, maybe some swat downs, maybe bat some balls, but, like, and the only batted ball today was an Andy, Dal- Andy Dalton batted ball. That was the only one, so keep that in mind. But um, there's not a whole lot for especially those front seven guys to be able to perform well and actually show that they can do this stuff. That's where you get more in the preseason or these joint practices where it's like, all right, now you got to show that you're doing stuff on defense. We want to see that you're actually, you know, progressing on defense and giving us something better to look at. Like these cornerbacks and linebackers can have good, you know, rushes. They can jump forward a little bit, create that pressure. But other than that, yeah, it's going to be pretty quiet from the defense. Now, I wanted to get y'all's thoughts with all the stuff that's been going on, like say with the Bengals or there's been some other situations. Do you think there's a possibility where we try to shop Corral out? For a backup or you know fill in spot. Oh, absolutely. After that was the plan going into the year anyway. At this point, when, uh, when you decided to keep him, I mean, there was no rush to get rid of him at this point. You know, you did spend a third round pick on him. You want to try to get some type of return back, and especially knowing that he'll get the majority of the snaps during the preseason. Yeah, shopping him is definitely the way to go. And, and there's going to be teams calling if he starts to make a splash. And I think I expect him to see a lot of growth this season anyway. Well, I think I think what you're going to see from Corral is a, a kid who feels like he's been mistreated and who feels like he's underrated. I think when you see him in preseason, he's going to put his best foot forward because to both of your points, um, he is shoppable. Um, if you look at the state of the quarterbacks right now and what's going on, I mean, he could very much end up in Tampa. You know, let's not let's not sit here and act like that can't happen. He can end up in Texas as a backup to C.J. Stroud. I mean, there, there, there are a lot of things that I think 
that we can use him for. I'm more interested to see, though, him being on the field with the number twos or the number threes, just how precise he is, because I don't think he got a fair shake, right? We only saw him for, what, a half a second? And in that half a second, he looked like he was in, he was he was he was not he was rattled a bit, you know, and, and he really didn't understand what was going on on the field. So he's had a whole year to kind of grow off the field. It's gonna be it's gonna be nice to see what he has to offer, and then if he does become shoppable. Yeah, I think especially you know like you said, uh, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, like there's opportunities where a quarterback might need to come in and take over at least as a band aid for a little while. I mean, he's been obviously not running with the twos. He's been running with the threes, and he's been making good throws in both ISO and in 11-on-11, and that's going to be his time to shine. We talk about it. Bryce Young should never see the light of day for a preseason game at at all. Like, the Fan Fest should be the last time he plays in Mega America Stadium up until that Week 2 game. And then for Andy Dalton, there's no reason to see Andy Dalton in preseason at all. We know – like, I'm at the point, like, I don't even need to see you at training camp. Like, do what you need to do to stay, like, lean and to stay, you know, fresh, but – I really don't need to see anything from you because we know what we're getting from you. Absolutely. I mean, I, 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 I do want to see Bryce a little bit. like, I, And I don't, I don't know what's considered the dress rehearsal game now since there's only three games. Like, you know, it used to be the third game. used to be the dress rehearsal. But wherever game you deem the dress rehearsal, I want to see Bryce jump like a quarter at, at, at most. But like, like you said, I don't need to see a whole lot. Matt Corral is a guy I am interested to see because, we, we, like, like Jason said, we only saw him for a very – small time as far as as far as his time like you know playing last year so i mean I, so like you said i mean i do want to see what what he looks like how did, how does he elevate i mean andy dalton like you said i would i prefer i prefer you not to be on the roster to be honest but again for <laughs> for just because i mean do you feel like going to a game with andy dalton is your starting quarterback like, do i i mean i should say i didn't really want to go to a game with baker mayfield or sam darnold as my starting quarterback but i mean that happened too. I'm saying if you had a choice, you wouldn't. <laughs> if I had a choice, well, no. If I had a choice, I wouldn't. But <laughs> who would you have as your backup? Like, do you ever? I would have Matt Corral. I would. I would. To, to Shantice's point, I think what Shantice is getting to is if you think about it, minus Andy Dalton, we got the youngest quarterbacks in the league. Oh yeah. Our backup would be our backup would be what second year, essentially. Yeah. Based on the one year, based on the one year he was down. So, I mean, really, he's a rookie too, to be one hundred percent honest. So you would have two rookie, con- two rookie quarterbacks with two rookie contracts. I mean, I get you bring. Sam- I mean, you bring. Um, I'm about to say Sam Donald. They're both gingers. My bad. Um, you bring, you bring Dalton in just as a a mentor, so, so to speak. Um, but for the most part, I would think that. I would rather have Corral as my backup, to be 100% honest. And to be fair, I'm not being serious. Like I just like, you, see, you just don't want to, I'm not paying for a ticket. No. And I said, I want to go see Andy Dalton play. If Andy Dalton's starting that week, I'm telling you what, I'm at the house. <laughs> I mean, I, I can save my money, you know what I'm saying? I can cook yeah. at the crib, you know what I'm saying? I can do a lot of things. I can get a lot of yard work done. I only got a yard, but I can get a lot of yard work done nonetheless if Andy Dalton's my starting quarterback. See, I'm going to get paid no matter who's the starting quarterback, so I'm fine with it either way. <laughs> now, I'll say I would feel better going – I feel better personally going, like hosting New Orleans if with Andy Dalton starting over Matt Corral. To be, I mean, if, I, if we're being completely honest, someone who's – He's got the, obviously now that's a bit of an isolated incident where he's got the familiarity with the team, so that gives me a little bit more confidence. I just, I don't know. I think it's good to have him there. I don't know why we, like I said, brought that other quarterback on for whatever reason. If I had my, if I had my preference, it'd be Cam as our backup quarterback. If I, if I really had my preference, who Cam? No, I would. Jack, I Jack, would. No, Jack. I, look, you know, you know scenario, I, I respect scenario. your opinion on a lot of things, right? Like we, like I really do. I, I mean, wholeheartedly, I respect your opinion on a lot of things. But uh, Shantice, I'm gonna need you to check, check, check that man, uh, heart rate and pockets, because I don't think he's 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 standing straight right now. We're not gonna let him say Cam should be the backup. Yeah, that's. A it would be a disaster if Cam was the backup. That's a little messy. 100 percent disaster. <laughs> That's a little messy, bro. I go, oh. Look, at it's not like the NBA where your backup point guard is actually going to have some impact on the team. He can just walk around and be fine. My ideal scenario, this is a complete joke, I'm going to preface it, is that Bryce Young goes hog wild this season. He goes off. He's putting up MVP numbers. He's putting up rookie of the year numbers. Then we get to, like, the a- NFC championship game, right? This is all a joke. I'm saying I'm going to put letters on it. It's all a joke. 
Vinny gets injured, right, in the, in the NFC Championship game. Cam's got to come in. Cam comes in and takes the game by storm, wins the Super Bowl for us. That's my perfect, perfect joke, completely hypothetical, non-serious or sensical, perfect scenario. It would be Cam just comes in, swoops over, and takes the, gets a ring. And I've left them speechless now. That's a, that's a first for the podcast. Chad, I was going to let you take that. I was going to let you take that one, my friend. You, you no, I mean, it. like, I don't. I mean, if I'm Cincinnati though, or if I'm Pittsburgh, if he's sitting there and he has, he wants to get a workout in. Bro, my, my perfect scenario for Cam, bro, is just go be a backup in Kansas City, bro. Go run the Wildcat. Go get your mm. go get your cheap one. You call it a day. Go call it. I day. actually would like to see Cam in Miami. They, but they got a uh, they got Teddy. I, I would like to see Cam in Miami. <laughs> fair enough. I mean, it's fair. No, it's fair. I mean, if I had to get a backup for him, we can always talk about it, and especially now, it'd probably be like Indianapolis. You know, he's not going to do. They're not going to mm. do anything well, but for Anthony Richardson, the same skill set. But you know, and it's funny. You sound a lot like Steve Smith. There, you see that one clip where Steve Smith was at the Wendy's in Spartanburg, and he told the fan to not wear the to uh, get rid of his number one jersey, and everyone's freaking out because like, oh, Cam, uh, Steve hates Cam. He doesn't think Cam is a good player. Oh, that's, good. that's the jersey that person was wearing. He was wearing number one jersey, yeah. Because you need to get a new one. But all he's saying is that Bryce is your quarterback now, so, like, get a number nine jersey. He's not hating on Cam. I will say this. It's a new day, right? And I agree. I was getting, I was getting ready to put on my dabbing T-shirt today, and I thought better of it as well because I think that's going to be for the games that I'm going to be struggling with. I'm going to need to dab on them. Um, but on, on, on a good day, I think Cam did what he had to do for the Panther organization at the time we needed him. Much respect due to him, and I agree. It is time to change the whole whole mantra and the whole narrative around the Panthers now because I'm going to tell you right now, to me, and I don't know about you guys, I was going to ask you guys this today. Do you feel like this season and what you're hearing from the coaching staff and what you're seeing come to fruition, like this is like we're going to win it now kind of mentality? Because that's, that's what I've been kind of feeling. After we had our, our face-to-face last week, and all you know, watching the the interviews and you know, reading the blogs and all these things this week, and just watching how we conduct ourselves in interviews, it's almost like it's a win now. We're going for it all. It does feel it does it it doesn't really feel like we're waiting on a rookie to to, to mature and everything. It does kind of feel like we we are in a uh, in a win now state. Not, I mean, there's no real pressure because there's no big contracts on this team right now either. But um, it does feel like we are. I won't say win now in terms of like contending, but definitely win now in terms of let's let's see if we can vie for a playoff spot. Let's see if we can win the division, a division that right now is wide open for for us to be able to take. Yeah, I mean, I, it it does feel like we're in that we're in that position for sure. I think one of the bigger like identifiers of the fact that we are trying to win now not doesn't really come from the coaching staff, but comes from the players. To be completely honest, like the way that they're getting into their roles and what they're doing, like specifically Brian Burns. If Brian Burns thought or had any sort of indication from the team that like this was going to be a process that's going to take two, three years to build up, I don't see him not like sitting out or really putting an urgency on this contract yeah. extension. But the fact of the matter where he said, you know, I feel what is happening right now is bigger than me, and I'm a key part of this defense, and this it, the defense's success is not he didn't say bigger than his, but like you know bigger than his personal gain, but. He kind of alluded to that, and you look at it in San Francisco, Bosa knows that he's the key part of that defense and that they are not horribly far away from really, really competing. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. if they get the quarterback situation figured out, they're a contender in that division. And so I think, and even he is taking his time to get these extensions underway before he does what he wants to do. So I really think that the players are putting that out there. You know, they're not wasting any time. I mean, you could think guys like Miles Sanders – Hayden Hurst that you know okay I can take my time and ease into this like they want they want to perform now I think the coaching staff obviously wants to perform now and you know however good they do it's going to be an issue because they're ultimately going to get success off of that and get opportunities off of that Mm -hmm. but like I just look at those guys some of these defenders like you know Von Bell coming in he was on a D uh, he was on a Super Bowl caliber team you know they had every chance to go back to the Super Bowl next year and for him to leave that to come to this team for the money that he got, you know, he knows what this defense can be and what they can give to the team. And I think just the different moves that the, that the players are making is really what puts that on display for me. I want to go back to that Bosa comment you made. I, I think the one thing for Bosa and the reason he's 
in the way reacting the way that he is his health has been a major concern for him the last two to three years he hasn't been 100 percent throughout the entire season and now we're talking about him resetting the market because when he's on the field he's a menace so you know for brian burns he is a menace but this is his year to prove how much of a menace he is if that makes sense so for him it's a it's a different conversation his health hasn't really been an issue right He's had a couple of dings, but nothing like Bosa. Like, Bosa's had some serious injuries the past two to three years. So he's got to get his money now. But what he means to that defense, San Francisco's an entirely different team without him being on there. And I think the – so I think, like, the coaching staff and the players, I think they all have that urgency. I'm interested to see the, how the urgency is put together and perpetrated by the front office, to be completely mm. honest. Because Tepper, you know, he's one of the guys he wants to do it and do it right. And he will, I think – be under the impression that it's going to take time. I think for Fitterer, what he did in the first round of free agency really proved like, yeah, we're trying to win right now. Like we're putting this cast around this rookie quarterback to do well. We're putting this, you know, we're adding pieces of the defense to solidify its abilities. And I think what it's going to come down to is that second round of free agency in season. Like we said, we've talked about it. All these Super Bowl teams outside of the Chiefs this past year have made major moves in the off season or in the in the season to elevate their team and do and put them in the next level. You know, in season we talk about the Bucks obviously getting guys, you know, like they got, you know, Antonio Brown in the off season, but then they get other guys that they try to go get in season as well. Do you think of the Rams with OBJ and Von Miller? And then even last year the Eagles getting, you know, a bunch of different guys on that defensive line to be able to Dominic Sue. Yeah. yeah Dominic and Dominic and Sue, um they got another guy, um, I, uh, I think it was not Limbaugh Joseph, I can't remember who it was. Um, so I think that's going to be something where, like, either in the defensive back group or in the linebacking core, where there's going to be someone who hasn't gotten that call up when we get into the season. And they're going to go, okay, you know what, throw him, in, throw him in anyway. Like, we need to get him. We need to make a move for this guy to elevate this team and put him where we need to. Yeah, absolutely. I can say that. Well, well, that will be evaluated as the season goes along. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll start, we'll get a look at how this team looks early on, how we think they'll fare long, long term throughout the season and see if you if another new move needs to be made. And, I, I, again, I, I think we're in a great position to do so. Uh, that's why they keep a lot of their options open. I, I, I feel like at least right now, not trying to make too too many moves right now and handicap themselves for later on in the season. But, yeah, I mean, I, th I think right now all the options are open for us. I think so, too. I think one thing I'm going to see, I think you're going to see tomorrow for FanFest, uh, Wednesday at the time of recording this, I think you're going to see a little bit more of, uh, you know, some fanfare, some presentation from Bryce Young. He's gotten a lot more comfortable as we've gone along. He's gotten a lot less rigid in his interviews and in his press conferences. So I don't think you're going to see anything too crazy like Cam Newton. You're never going to see anything like that. But I think he's going to put on a little bit more of a show. I think he's going to show up a little bit. He's going to be definitely starstruck. The lights are going to hit him pretty bright. But I think once he makes a few passes and gets a few, you know, the fans have been very supportive of him while he's been going on. But I think that uh, I think it's something you're going to see. Jason, anything you got to wrap up? No, no, no. For me, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the results from FanFest. I'm excited for Bryce Young. I'm excited for Mingo. I'm excited for those young cats. I'm also excited for a lot of the veterans coming in with this new this new organization almost, right, um, top to bottom. I think it's going to, to your point, it's going to be a different feel of a fan fest, the best that we've probably felt in the last eight or nine years um, with this new with this new kind of uh, mantra amongst us. I agree. It'll be a lot to see. It'll be good to see. We want to ask you all some questions, of course, as we round out this. We want to know, we had the video full up on Spotify, had a full video podcast. We had it up on YouTube as well. Which one do y'all prefer to have the full video on? Because we can do both. If you want just the audio on Spotify and then the video on YouTube, let us know what y'all want from that. And then let us know as well anything that you want to see. Like we talked about here in the background, we'll talk about what we're wearing. I got this amazing inaugural painting t-shirt. Look at that. Against the Rams, 1995, 1 o'clock at the Col or let's see, at the Clemson Memorial Stadium. Just an awesome, awesome mural. Shanti's, of course, you got the metallic, too. Oh, yeah, man. And you can't talk about the hat enough. Uh, yeah, but the, but the leather hat, bro. I, I saw it as soon as I came in. I was like, yeah, I got to get it. He might, he might be leaving with that hat. That might be something he's leaving with. And, of course, all the different things here. This These holy grails, this duffel bag, the champion's hat. Jason, what caught your eye? Honestly, I'm, I'm not even going to lie. I joked about it before we got on camera. That Kerry Collins is sticking out. I hated that regime, but that, that jersey definitely, definitely – 
is, is sticking out to me. You don't find any of those without any burn marks on them left anymore. You don't <laughs> yeah. find any of those that are intact anymore. So that definitely one was cool to see. But y'all, like I said, we've got Fan Fest coming up tomorrow. We'll have the Jets next week. We'll be back here at Locker Room Charlotte. If you haven't checked them out, if you're all the listeners in the Charlotte and Carolina area, if you're able to make a drive, come check them out. It's Watershed Charlotte is the name of the building, but if you go to their website, or excuse me, their socials, well, they're working on getting the website up, but if you go into their socials, you'll see where the address is. You'll see it post how to get there and come and check out all this cool stuff. And until next time, keep pounding.